It was beautiful. Okay, so here we are at the very tail end of our course on Wilbur. In fact, we only have one more class after tonight, which is uh, probably a relief to everybody. Um, <laughs> it will be to me, I have to say. Anyway, so tonight we're we're going to talk about the languages of the divine from Wilbur's point of view. So now that we've become acquainted with the major elements of Ken Wilbur's integral model, we're now in a position to comprehend his concluding thoughts on the impact this model has already had and how it may assist in the current and future emergence of the integral structure of consciousness. Sorry, I've got a phone call coming in and I'm closing off. Okay, so I need a screen share. So what I've done is I've just done a, a handy dandy list of some of the big topics that we've covered. And as I put it together, I realized we've covered a lot of material in a short period of time. So just to run down these, he, we've covered the modifications Wilbur believes are required to rehabilitate the great chain of being idea. He's also talked about what might be involved in a fourth turning of the wheel of Dharma in Buddhism. But he's saying that e this is equally applicable to all other world religions. Uh, we've taken a look at his four quadrants, not in any real depth, but uh, you know now that two of them pertain to the individual, both the subjective and the objective views and two which relate to the collective. Again, intersubjective and interobjective. We took a brief look at the dozens of lines of development, especially that of the development of, of self and one's faith. Uh, the many horizontal typologies by which our personalities may be described. So for instance, uh, what did we look at? Uh, Myers-Briggs and the Enneagram the bodies and associated energies we possess in the gross, subtle, and causal worlds. Then there are the natural states of consciousness we access on a daily basis, or as well the trained states we could potentially access. Then there are eight or more structures of consciousness that the human race was unaware of until 1900. And the most common of these are magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, and integral. We took a brief look at the culture wars currently being waged between the mythic, rational, and pluralistic structures. And then recently, the way that states and structures intersect along with the brand new realization that each of the major structures interprets the states of consciousness they experience in significantly different ways. And then we found out about the dual center of gravity that each of us has, the cosmic address. And Wilbur was reminding us that the ultimate goal in Buddhism is to seamlessly combine freedom and fullness, which he calls waking up and growing up. And lastly, we took a quick look at the four meanings of the word spiritual. Phew, that's a fair amount of information. So with that, those numerous elements in mind, let's turn to the final two chapters of the religion of tomorrow. So I'll just go back here for now. Surveying the overall progress of Western religion in the last millennium or so, Wilbur notes that humanity has gone from God everywhere to God nowhere, and is now slowly entering a period of God everywhere again. However, the God that is everywhere this time around is a much different God. In fact, the new God at the, is at the opposite end of the spectrum of development than the original God and possesses few, if any, similar characteristics. So we have evolved the concept of God everywhere. Okay, so I wonder if we could start with David Erickson reading number one for us. Okay. 
This demands an entirely new language of God talk, a completely new way to communicate about these ever present, all pervading realities and totally different version of signs and symbols representing these wildly new, astonishing, shocking realities. Our coming new world demands a new language altogether. Yeah. Hmm. So what he is calling for is a completely new form of semiotics, which he calls, not surprisingly, integral semiotics. And maybe Belinda could pick up on number two for us. Okay. Are we? Yeah. Okay. Semiotics, also called semiotic studies, is the systematic study of sign processes, semiosis, and meaning making. Semiosis is any activity, conduct, or process that involves signs. Where a sign is defined as anything that communicates something, usually called a meaning, to the sign's interpreter. The meaning can be intentional, such as a word uttered with a specific meaning, or unintentional, such as symptom being a sign of a particular medical condition. Signs can also communicate feelings, which are usually not considered meanings, and may communicate internally through thought itself or through any of the senses, visual, auditory, tactile, olfactory, or gustatory taste. Contemporary semiotics is a branch of science that studies meaning making and various types of knowledge. Okay, thank you. So Wilbur maintains that virtually all schools of semiotics are built around flatland ontologies. And when he uses the term flatland, what he's saying is that they don't believe in anything beyond physical reality. So I don't know what the, how they interpret emotions, for instance, how they interpret thought. They have no time for the idea of a soul, or let alone spirit. So all that is, dis, is discarded. In other words, flatlanders believe that the physical world is the only form of reality. By way of example, Wilbur offers three expressions, dog, the square root of negative one, and God. Of these three, only dog is universally agreed to refer to things that exist. That's because, because dogs exist in the sensory motor or flatland world. The other expressions are taken as iffy. Maybe they refer to things that exist, maybe they don't. It depends on your philosophy and your religion. But dogs are real because they exist in the one uncontestedly real world space, the physical sensor motor, sensory motor. Now, this fellow is Ferdinand de Saussure. He lived from 1857 to 1913. Uh, he's the father of linguistics. He pointed out that a sign has actually three components. So here they are. There's the original referent. So that's the thing that you're talking about, that you've created a word to describe. So in this case, we're gonna talk about an apple. Then there's the sign itself, which has two aspects, a signifier and a signified. So the signifier is the material mark, which is written or spoken, or it's an indicator such as the word apple written on a page or the spoken word apple you are hearing at this moment. The signified is what comes to your mind when you read or hear a particular signifier. So when I say the word apple, what do you immediately think of? Is there a particular type that you like? Uh, is it a red one or a green one or a yellow one? Do you have any associations with the use of apples? Do you immediately start thinking of the old days when you took an apple to a teacher? Or do you think of orchards, etc.? So there are a whole series of associations that are built up in your mind, which are referred to as the signified. 
just by that one word. Now, let's take a look at a quick diagram here. So here's the real thing, the apple in the center, which is the sign. I should have actually put referent in here because Wilbur uses that term a lot more than he does object or thing. Then there's the signifier. So that's the sound or the word or the image itself. Even the image is not the real thing. Okay. And then there's the signified, and that's the concept that you have when you hear that word or see that word written on the page. So look at this fruit, apple, freshness, healthy, temptation, teacher's pet, computer, etc. So this may or may not be something that you've spent any time studying. I don't really know. But I felt we needed to uh, at least cover it in quick brushstrokes at this point. But note that all of the, none of these four is the actual referent. Even this picture is not an apple. So neither the signifier thor nor the signified, these two at the bottom, is the same as the actual apple. This means that any sign has to be interpreted before it can actually signify something real. So, of course, Wilbur then decides, well, why don't we look at it in terms of the four quadrants? Where do these signifiers and signifieds sit? So the signifier, which is the the actual sign or word or symbol is in the upper right quadrant, which is the individual exterior or objective one. The signified, what it brings up in your mind is of course in the upper left. Now, when we talk about the collectives, all of the material signifiers in the system. So everything in the right-hand side, oops. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. <clears throat> so all the material signifiers, the words that are used to describe that apple or whatever, are in a system of grammar that's in the lower left. And then all the actual signifieds, so that's what you think of when you hear those words, forms what's called semantics, the world of actual meanings, and that's in the lower right. Now, this is where I wanted to make the point that none of these four refers to the actual referent, to the actual apple. As Wilbur has said many times, the four-quadrant map is not the territory. So where is the referent then? Where is it located? Where can we find it? All the semiotic systems assume that any real referent, as opposed to something imaginary or fantastical, or illusory is located in the right hand sensory motor world, the physical material gross world. Belinda, you do you have your hand up? Is that no? Okay, I wasn't sure if I misinterpreted. See, I'm interpreting your signal. <laughs> then a semiotic theory is built around these sensory motor reference. So let's come back here. And see if we can convince Alan to read number three for us. Sure, three. If it, a semiotic system, has signifiers, they are all right hand sensory motor items. Syntax is all right hand sensory motor or physical systems of sensory motor information bits. Semantics for all real entities, all point to the sum right hand semi, pardon me, sensory motor referent. And as for the signified, it is usually taken as some sort of mental picture or representation of the sensory motor referent. Okay, so that's traditional semiotics. 
But the only problem with this pr approach is that it completely privileges and absolutizes the sensory motor world space. That is ultimately the only world space that is really real. This is the implicit, if not plainly explicit assumption in virtually all forms of semiotics. But is the sensory world space the only real world space? Wilbur says that the first thing you learn in developmental studies is that the physical sensory motor world space is not the only world space that exists. As he attempted to show throughout his many writings, each major level of development sees a different world. Okay, I see Lori is on tonight. So welcome back from Israel, Lori. Thank you very much. It's great to have you back. Thank you. It's great to be here. So would you mind reading number four for us? Okay. We might say that it each major level of development coenacts a new and in many ways different world or world space, each with more complexity, more consciousness more differenti differentiation, integration. And these are not merely different interpretations of a single pre-given real world, the, sensor mo the sensory motor, but ontologically new worlds in many real ways, Ken Wilbur. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So each new level has a relative reality that is as real as real can be at that level. As Hegel put it, every level is adequate. Every higher level is more adequate. And that's, of course, talking about the transcend and include idea. As you evolve, you're embracing more of reality. You're understanding more. So what evolutionary and developmental studies tell us is that there is a sliding scale of truth. Each level has truth. Each higher level has more truth. This also means that each level has a set of relatively real reference. Things that are actually real. These are real objects and phenomena that can be adequately represented by a particular signifier. Okay, so uh, Linda, is Ingrid on tonight? I didn't see her when we started. No, the Ingrid's not here tonight. Okay, so maybe Lisa could read number uh, five for us. Sure. <clears throat> if the individual has developed to the level where the specific referent exists and has experienced that referent, then that individual will be able to have a fairly accurate signified emerge in his or her awareness when they see the signifier. In other words, they will be able to understand that signifier. If they have not developed to that level, then it's all Greek to them. It's all over their heads. They can't understand the signifier because they don't have a developmental signified that is up to the task. So as an example, one of the probably most challenging parts of this course was trying to explain the concept of emptiness to everybody. And for most of us, it is it was all Greek to us. It was all over our heads, right? How many of us had had an actual experience of emptiness? That's what he's saying here. If you haven't had that experience, it doesn't mean that much to you. It doesn't speak to who you are or where you're at. So the point is that the sensory motor world space is not the only single, only real world space. It is simply one of numerous world spaces in terms of both structures and states of consciousness. These are also real, in some cases, much more real. 
and specifically non-dual ultimate reality would qualify there. In the case of structures, there's the infrared or sensory motor world space, the magenta world space, the red world space, the amber world space, the orange, the green, the teal, the turquoise, the indigo, the ultraviolet, and the white. Those are all world spaces which contain reference that once we get to that level, we can become acquainted with them personally. In the case of states, there is the gross physical or sensory motor world space, the subtle, the causal, the empty witness, and the ultimate non-dual. Each and every one of these world spaces have phenomena in them that are seen, felt, and experienced as fully real when one is in that particular world space. The sum total phenomena available within the four quadrants marks the total world spaces of that particular structure or state. Previously, we asked, where does a particular referent exist? What's Wilbur's answer? Every referent exists in a specific world space. Hmm. It's an interesting way of perceiving the problem. You know, we talk about mysticism and the things that we experience there, but we have no way of really placing them anywhere. Because what we're trying to do often is just figure out how they relate to the sensory motor world, to physical reality. But they're different. And the same is true of dreams. They take place in a totally different world space. <clears throat> and in fact, within dreams, there's a whole range of world spaces. So if a particular world space has a phenomenon that is a common experience or occurrence in a particular culture, then that culture will give that phenomena or referent a word, a signifier. So I'm not sure it's actually true, but it's popularly said that the Inuit have 28 words for snow, mm -hmm. which is clearly a very common experience for them. These would be 28 signifiers for the referent we refer to as snow. If a typical Inuit hears any of those 28 words or signifiers, they will commonly understand more or less exactly what is intended. In other words, a correct signified will arise in their mind. Whereas if Americans in the South say, hear almost any of those signifiers, they will just have no idea, no signified of what is meant. They are likely to respond with, it's just snow, you know, that white stuff. That's all they know. So contemplative traditions have numerous worlds, words or signifiers for various states. So for instance, in Eastern traditions, we, we find Savikalpa Samadhi, Nirvikalpa Samadhi, Advaya Samadhi, Jnana Samadhi, Sahaja Samadhi, Nirvana, Niroda, and so on. The members of any meditation community quickly come to learn the appropriate signifiers of the state reference they are seeking to contact. The fact that that all goes over our, mind, over our heads says something about where we live, what world space we inhabit. <clears throat> For us, this means that we need to name the higher structures and states. They need to be given signifiers and they need to be acknowledged as just as real, sometimes even more real than any sensory motor object. By naming them, they will become part of the lower left semantic world space to be accessed by everyone. The experience itself will always be beyond, beyond any words. Wilbur asserts that all experiences, not just mystical ones, are ineffable. You can't adequately describe a sunset, an orgasm, or box music but words can be used to refer to them and thus indicate their genuine reality. If the referent is truly uncommon, 
such as a causal formless or luminous experience, the person lacking any similar experience might believe that it's not really real. It's just some weird semi-hallucinated experience that they've had. This is the primary reason why we need to develop a vocabulary for the experiences of higher structures and states. And if I could just say uh, as a side note, I think that's one of the things the Baha'i writings provide us is a very nuanced set of vocabulary for states beyond our own level of consciousness. And I think that's what Abdu'l Baha was trying to get at with his list of the stages of the soul. There's a whole world in each of those levels. So let's look at a few examples. When you read or hear the terms the Godhead or the non dual one, Buddha nature, Ein Sof, Dharmakaya, Ayan, the supreme identity, the Tao, enlightenment, liberation, infinite freedom and fullness, radical awareness, and pure consciousness, you will have a correct signified come to mind if you have had any of these experiences and you will know what is meant. But I'm willing to bet to guess that most of us in this call haven't had most of these experiences. So, Bill, could you read uh, the sixth item here for us? Otherwise, <clears throat> it will be all Greek to you, meaningless words with no real reference, and thus no signifies, and thus no reality for you. You will think that those references don't exist, whereas what actually doesn't exist is your experiential access to the world space, which those references are most definitely very real. The voice is worse. Yeah, I wonder if he's had COVID. We can hear you guys. <laughs> anyway, okay. So you have to develop to the world space in which the real referent exists in order to have a correct signified come to mind when you hear or read any of its signifiers. And this doesn't just apply to lofty religious reference. If a particular referent exists in the orange rational world stage, as does the square root of negative one, you have to have developed orange altitude in order to be able to see or feel that referent at all. It requires the study of orange mathematics, which you won't be able to understand at the lower amber, red, magenta, or infrared rungs of the ladder. Otherwise, it will be all Greek to you. It will make no sense. It will be over your head. If the referent exists in the indigo world space, such as the psychophysical nature of the real world, the co-creative, co-inactive nature of consciousness, you have to have developed at least indigo in order to correctly understand what that means. Uh, Joey, are you available there for seven? If the referent exists in the causal world space, such as, a, as the formless, timeless nature of ultimate reality or spirit, you have to either have a peak experience of that state or your state center of gravity has to be have developed to that state stage usually because you have practiced some form of meditation or contemplation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's talk about the importance of naming. Wilbur concludes that all reference exists in world spaces. Naming higher structures and states of consciousness opens the doorway to our own growth and development. It gives the mind permission to begin thinking in those directions. It reassures us that those realities are indeed really there. 
Of course, we don't want to confuse words or maps with the real territory. But we also don't want maps that leave out huge sections of the real territory so that we don't even suspect they exist. So get a complete map first and let it then let it go for your direct experience of that territory is Wilbur's advice. Name it, that is the key to all realities. If we don't adequately name it, the signifier, then for all intents and purposes, it, the real referent doesn't exist or won't commonly exist. If we won't have any real way of talking about it with anybody. Okay, dokie. Oh, Zilda, how do you feel about reading us another time here? Number eight. Eight, I just have to unmute. Most people in this culture are completely unaware of the fundamental structure stages. The hidden maps that govern so much of their lives. They are unaware of the progress through stage state, state stages that they can engage and that can result in the shocking resurrection of their own truest and deepest selves, a supreme identity with the divine itself in all its radiant, infinite, timeless, and eternal, glorious, sumptuous, superabundant grandeur. They are the victims, not of a confuse, confusing. They are the victims, not of confusing a map with a territory, but of having no map whatsoever to alert them to these stunning territories. Lacking an integral semiotics, they are cut off from an emancipated future. This is the core sadness at the very heart of our human culture. Yeah, thank you. That's sad, isn't it? They don't know what they're missing. Integral semiotics is about recognizing that everything or event, in other words, every referent, has a cosmic address. That is, it, it exists in some particular world space somewhere in the aqual matrix, the four quadrants. If you want to be able to see that real thing or event, you have to put yourself in the same vicinity as the cosmic address of the event you want to see or experience. Your cosmic address must generally align with the cosmic address of the thing you want to experience, or it won't happen. Okay, how about David Oak tonight? Number nine. Okay, here we go. Uh, thus, if you want to know if God as the formless ground of all being really exists, you have to orient yourself in the upper left quadrant. Take up a practice that moves your state center of gravity from gross to subtle to causal and then using a first person perspective in that causal state in the upper left quadrant look. And if you are like 95% of people who have done so, you will experience this vast, clear, infinite, formless, empty, dark because it transcends the world, but radically luminous because it is infused by radiant spirit, ultimate reality. And you will know for yourself as to the reality of this groundless ground of being hmm. so the instructions are clear aren't they if you want that experience this is what you have to do in order to move your cosmic address close enough to that cosmic address to be able to appreciate it thanks david you're welcome so by putting your cosmic address in the same general vicinity as the cosmic address of the referent of that signifier, in this case, the formless ground of being, you can directly experience that reference with what he calls a knowledge by acquaintance, flooding your being. You may also be thrown into that vicinity by a near-death experience, 
or a drug experience or a walk in nature or making love or listening to Bach, et cetera, et cetera. Wilbur's main point here is that all actual reference exist in particular world spaces. They have specific cosmic addresses. They are not lying around in a flatland pre-given world waiting to, to be perceived by all and sundry. A cosmic address is actually the sum total of aqual dimensions of any given phenomenon. We live in a universe that has no center any longer. This means that anything or any event can be taken as the center of the universe. Everything else may then be related to its location. Its location is thus related to all the other phenomena in the universe. Therefore, its address, in his terms, its cosmic address, can only be identified by giving a list of its relative relations to other known phenomena. The aqua matrix is designed to do exactly this. So Wilbur gives us three examples to clarify his concept of cosmic addresses. The first concerns an emotional state of consciousness. Linda O'Neill, since you're back, I think, did I see you there? Or am I dreaming? No, I just got to unmute. Oh, there you go. Oh, right. Yeah, this is number 10. Sorry, I'll move the screen a bit. Yeah. Okay. Thus, a simple cosmic address of a given emotional state might be that it, it exists in quadrant run, one, upper left, in the emotional intelligence line at an amber altitude in a gross state with an Enneagram type, Enneagram type five and defiling, that is unhealthy emotion type four. In the known universe, that is enough information to identify the general location of that particular emotional state along with its major qualities and characteristics. That's several pieces of information that have to be brought together to pinpoint you. Okay, thank you. The second example is of a jet fighter, which is a social product or artifact. It exists in quadrant four, which is the lower right, in the military defense line at a teal altitude. It's a very high state of development in a gross state of a fighter F-16 type of a United States type. And the third example is God as loving ground or the great thou. It exists in quadrant two, which is the lower left at the ultraviolet attitude in the Bhakti line of development in the low causal state expressing the spirit in second person type and the Saguna type. Phew. Anyway, you can start to see that, you know, he's thought through this fairly carefully. And there are many, many aspects that have to be considered in order to be able to pinpoint a cosmic address. By the way, Saguna is a term that refers to the manifestation of God or Brahman in Hinduism. Saguna Brahman is the personal aspect of Brahman appearing as an incarnation in human or animal form, which may be worshipped by believers. And it's the opposite of Nirguna Brahman, which has no attributes whatsoever. So the sensory motor world space is only one of dozens of world spaces, each with a plethora of real phenomena or real reference. Each of those real reference can be given as a signifier. And if you have actually experienced that referent, you will have a generally correct signified arise in your mind as you hear or read the signifier. And you will know for yourself whether that referent is real or not. The main problem with spirituality in today's world is a semiotic one. Most modern and postmodern cultures simply do not have a vocabulary for any third tier structure views or spirit. 
or any higher experiences of spirit. In the West, spirit, the actual referent itself, is confined almost solely to the magic and mythic views of reality. Although these are not unreal occasions for the individuals at those levels, they are less real compared to higher trans-rational trans and transpersonal structures and states. Okay, Jennifer, I think I'm going to ask you to read number 11 here. <clears throat> All that was required was that they, their deep structures, transcend and include their That's predecessors. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My daughter's on the phone for me, so I'm a little bit. <laughs> okay. And the transrational realms are explicitly not pre-rational. They transcend and include rationality. But these realms are as far above rationality as the tooth fairy is beneath it. Yet we treat all spiritual concerns as if they were indeed not much more than tooth fairies of one sort or another. God is an adult's great imaginary friend in the sky. This is pathetic, truly. Wow. So no wonder that God had to die. <laughs> Good riddance. We need something a little more sophisticated. The original God. Okay. In Wilbur's view, semiotics is a matter of emancipatory interest. For him, semiotics is the doorway to freedom, liberation, release, fullness, abundance, overflowingness, outrageous love and joy and bliss and beauty and being, unborn and undying, unmade and uncreate infinite and all-pervading, eternal and all-inclusive. These are all just words, but they are some of the 28 words for spirit. And the richness of our vocabulary points to the richness of our very being. Of course, we don't want to confuse words with reality, map with territory, sign with referent, theory with fact. But at the same time, we don't want to have a totally screwed up map either, or worst case scenario, no map at all. A map that stops at mythic literal and deliberately excludes all higher states and structures it is about as screwed up a map of ultimate reality as the modern and postmodern world could possibly produce. So much of what we are looking at, looking for, already exists. At this point, it is simply a matter of naming it, of locating it, of finding its cosmic address, and following the injunctions and directions for accessing that cosmic address ourselves, and then directly experiencing it, along with all that it brings with it. It is nothing less than our own emancipation that we are talking about here. So let's have a slightly different thought for the last part. Many people in integral circles believe that al although integral is making a big intellectual splash, integral approaches aren't making much of an impact on the real world. Wilbur strongly disagrees with this assessment. He goes on to summarize more than 10 gains that integral approaches have made in the five years preceding the publication of The Religion of Tomorrow. So that makes it from 2013 to 17. Here are a few of the more striking examples. For an entire year, 2011 to 12, the Architectural Review published an article each month on an aqual integral reformulation of architecture itself called The, Re the Big Rethink. The government of the United Kingdom released its official report on the British capacity to respond to climate change, a several hundred page review that used an aqual integral framework as its basis. The Unity Church officially adopted the aqual integral framework to create its main teaching of an integral Christianity. Ubiquity University, a worldwide university founded across the board on integral principles was created. 
There are several publishing imprints devoted to integral books from integral publishing to the Sunni integral series. And according to the Journal of Integral Theory and Practice, 60 or so disciplines have been reformulated using aqual integral approaches. These are not insignificant. However, as Wilbur himself points out, these examples miss the point. The saying that we are playing a game of miles and yet are seeing progress in only inches and feet completely misses what real progress actually means. This kind of lack of progress complaint equates the real world with the mere sensory motor world and overlooks the existence and fundamental reality of all of the interior world spaces, from infrared to magenta to red to amber to orange, to green to teal to turquoise to indigo to violet to ultraviolet to white. And the very real phenomenon that can be found in each and every one of these very real world spaces. From this perspective, when progress isn't made in the sensory motor world, all of the progress being made in the other world spaces is completely overlooked, and the wine of no progress at all rises up definitely. So what is real progress to Wilbur? He maintains that in virtually all cases, real progress in the world, in the real world begins with the creation in a particular interior world space, such as orange or amber or green and so on, all of which are in the upper left quadrant, right? The introspective, the subjective individual. So there's a growing set of real objects or real phenomenon related to whatever is under consideration. This may be a particular problem requiring a solution, a particular invention that's needed, a particular approach to a, an issue or some red hot conflict area, et cetera, et cetera. These newly created objects are created within a particular world space and are utterly real and ontologically there. So where are these new objects stored? Wilbur isn't entirely sure, but leans towards the storehouse consciousness of the causal realm as described by the Lankavatara Sutra of Buddhism. But wherever they are stored, they have real causative impact on the sensory motor world. Morphic fields is another idea that is a possibility here. So I'd like to talk tonight about two of the structures and we'll add a third next week. To make this progress, the process of emergence clearer, Wilbur explains how the red structure first emerged some 50,000 years ago. Let's see here. Ah, Linda Russell is next, number 12. Reading number 12. All that was required was that they, their deep structures, transcend and include their predecessors. But having done that, they could have developed in any number of different ways. But once they began forming in one way, red structures around the world began forming in an identical fashion. That was some perhaps 50,000 years ago. And now today, wherever you find red around the world, and in its cognitive forms, it has been investigated in over 40 diverse populations, from Amazon rainforest tribes, to Australian Aborigines, to Russian workers, to Mexican nationals, and in every case, it has exactly the same deep structures. Hmm. So let's take a closer look at the dynamics of this emergence. Those red structures begin as some red thoughts, which were real interior phenomena in the upper left quadrant of a handful of individuals. Through their upper right quadrant behavior, they communicated them to other individuals who might understand what they were talking about. As their numbers grew, red we structures in the lower left quadrant 
which is the intersubjective field, began to form. In other words, real red we objects or things or phenomena began to form in the lower left quadrant. As these red thoughts continue to take hold, eventually around the world, uh, as the red structure started to emerge in other places, its structure tended to be the same as had grown in the original group. Uh, Eva, could you read 13 for us? Sure. As this indicator, red objects continue to build, the individuals continue to think in red terms. Those objects eventually spilled out of individuals, interiors, and began to create material, sensory motor, social institutions in the lower right. Empires began to form and each in turn, particularly at it gave way to Amber, conquered most of the world, of the known world in its time. Hmm. Okay. So, such is the dynamic nature of creativity, as we've seen it in the red structure. Now let's take a look at the orange one, which is a lot closer in time to us. Much of the same process was operating in the emergence and development of the orange structure. When representative democracy first began to appear in the modern West, it was just a, a thought in the mind of a few Renaissance thinkers. The notion of individual freedom was quite novel at the time, given the amber mythic membership conformity, a monarchical rule that held sway in that era. But a handful of individuals began creating internal orange objects, world-centric objects, rational objects, trans-mythic objects. Uh, Meryl, could you read 14, our last reading for us, please? Did they run out and create democratic revolution on the spot? Of course not. The internal objects weren't nearly clear enough yet in all their forms. In fact, it would take a few hundred years of continuing to build these orange interior objects, real phenomena in the real orange world space, that had the names of individual freedom, democratic representation, non-monarchical government, and so on. Uh -huh. Thank you. So these interior thought objects continue to grow up to the time of the Paris salons and the cafe society where these orange objects began to inhabit a larger and larger number of orange we spaces, thus becoming real objects, real phenomena in the orange we world space. Finally, after several hundreds of years of interior object building, these objects spilled out into the sensory motor world with the American and French revolutions, creating institutions in the right-hand quadrants that were the materializations of the orange interior objects of the left-hand quadrants. After hundreds of years of building and being stored somewhere in the cosmos, these orange objects finally produced absolutely real and stunning effects in the physical world. Now, just as a teaser for next week, one of the reasons I'm going into all this detail about the process, the dynamic process of how a new structure is born is because we're all participating in the birth and emergence of a new structure. We've been doing it through our work in the Baha'i faith. And I'll have a lot more to say about the integral structure next time. So next week, we will look at Wilbur's uplifting thoughts concerning the emergence and developments of the integral structure. 
And as you know, it'll be the final class of the Arc of Ascent course. As you know, my hope as we started the course was to enrich our understanding of Abdul Baha's portrayal of the stages of the soul available to human beings in the future. Through a comparison of the visionary findings of Ibn Arabi in Islam, Sri Aurobindo in Hinduism, several meditational paths in Buddhism, and Wilbur's vast present day synthesis, I hoped that we could begin to develop a sensitivity to the many worlds beyond the sensory motor one. 30 months later, I still hold out hope that these inter-religious investigations have provided you with a richer understanding of the spiritual heights and breadth that Abdul Baha outlined in his commentary on the Surah of Rum. Therefore, I plan to devote the second half of our last class to listening to you. I would like to hear your thoughts, comments, insights, critiques, and points of view relating to the overall course. So please take some time over the next seven days to give shape to your feedback. I would dearly love to hear from every one of you, including those of you watching online. And so we have a half hour that is devoted to you. We're starting right now. And I will just stop sharing, for, see who's here. Okay. Oh, I see we've got some chat items in here. Here's your chat items. I missed a lot of those. Hmm. Oh. Linda O'Neill says there are as many as 52 items in a nook to took for that. The, that was the claim. Is that, is that what you meant, Linda? Or is that what that man meant? The writer? Oh, you're not. Sorry, you're muted, Linda. Yes, this these were terms for ice and snow. Hmm. Up to 52. Wow. Hmm. And then Heather is saying when Winifred Harvey went on pilgrimage in 1956, she asked the guardian how to explain the rose to the Inuit who had never seen or smelt the rose. He gave her a vial of rose water to help explain the concept. Unfortunately, she's had to leave, so she doesn't know we're talking about her. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that I'm up to date on the chat now. Thank you very much for putting that in, Linda. I didn't know 52. Wow. Okay, so who would like to go first? Lori's got her, no? Who's? You can do the raised hand in the list here, or you can just... Physically raise your hand. I'm not sure. Bill's wanting to uh, say something here. Yes, I'm, I'm a little more lighthearted. Uh, I just wanted to relate that in Vermont, in the mountains, the uh, people who live in the hills, when they see people who aren't from around there do something stupid, they they look at each other and they just say, Flatlanders. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Bill, on that topic, or uh, <laughs> you're still thinking? No, no I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, they have much else to say today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just so a second. David's up now. David. Yeah, Oak. I, this thought really hasn't matured yet in my mind, but. Let's say, well, you use the example of an apple, mm -hmm. but let's say you use the word democracy instead of apple. Okay. How, how would that alter it? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Um, maybe I don't know what I'm asking either, but- uh, do, you, do you want me to see, bring an, up an the apple signifier? is a material thing. Um, and, and I guess what you were saying about different levels of reality, um, democracy is at a different level than an apple. But it's still an object. Yes. It, it operates at a higher level than the physical mm -hmm. plane, but 
it does have repercussions at the physical level for sure. Okay, so if we put democracy here instead of the apple, the the signifier would be the the, the word on the screen, uh, D E M O C R A C Y, mm -hmm. and then uh, <clears throat> the sound of me saying that word, and of course it would have translations in different languages, and then the signified would be what concepts jump to your mind when you hear the word democracy. How detailed an understanding do you yeah. have of what's involved in a democracy? Could you give examples of governments that are democratic? Mm -hmm. Are you worried about whether that's being eroded at the moment, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I guess what I was getting at, if something is a, a physical object and one is a mental construct, mm -hmm. um, would it have a different you know, would the tools alter in dealing with it? I'm not sure that they would. I think yeah. the same kind of relationship is going to be available no matter what. Mm -hmm. But of course, you're, you're moving from the sensory motor world to an intellectual world or a rational world. Yes. I was thinking also you're working from a finite world since a, an apple has a certain weight and measurement mm -hmm. to, uh, and a time it goes rotten after a little while yeah. towards something that is infinite. It has no physical dimension to it and can be infinite. Well, I'm um, not sure if it can be infinite, but it, I mean, because you can measure it. In mm -hmm. certain ways, you know, how many countries in the world are democratic? You have to define it very carefully before you can answer that question. Yeah. Are there degrees of democracy you know, on the path towards an ultimate state? Is any country at the moment experiencing a perfect form of democracy, for instance? Yeah. Or is that is that a, a, a platonic idea that we will never achieve? Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, I, I that's uh, as I said, I hadn't, you know, it's sort of a half formed thought. Well, I mean, if it if it uh, pulls you in that direction, you could, you know, spend some time thinking about it over this week and then come back next week. Yes. With further questions or answers. You could explain yeah. it to us all. Oh, I, I think this is. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Give me, give me seven days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Joey, what are you thinking? Well, I was going back to, um, as David was talking about, the sign mm -hmm. and the signified. And so from when I was looking at Apple, immediately when we were looking at this diagram, I thought, okay, this will take me to a particular type of Apple. Um, and then I have the flavor of that apple and why it's different. But then I get taken off from that to a particular experience, um, which is a much deeper understanding than just the, uh, the physical apple, because I get taken to an experience with a specific person and what that person was like. And now I'm in a totally different realm. Mm -hmm. So I've gone way past the sign and the signified and the signifier. So I, I'm not sure what so, that is. Well, what you're doing is re remembering an experience with the actual referent. So that just could take you all over the place depending on how much experience you have with it just like the inuit with 52 words for snow and ice uh, they will have huge numbers of experiences with probably most of those right you know so how many people you know know what freezing rain is or sleet or you know can differentiate between all those things only people who have experienced them will really be able to tell you in a convincing way what the differences are. 
based on their own personal experiences. And that's what you have with that particular kind of apple. Yeah. So was it a gala or a Macintosh or what? <laughs> it was a honey crisp. Oh. And no one will be able to understand because he's had that experience with that apple, which ended up being quite quite a special experience. It was an experience that had nothing to do with the physical apple. Hmm. But the honey crisp is the best apple. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I disagree. I think Gala is right up there. Royal Gala. No. Anyway, I mean, <laughs> we could just get silly about this, but you can understand that you're tapping into personal depth here now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so is this David or Belinda that's talking now? David, okay. You're muted, David. Whoop. You're on mute. There you go. Okay. I don't know whether I'm going to make any sense or not, but, you know, at all, but just... Uh, that's a great start. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, no, I, I just... If you go back to reading two, Reading to the office. And um, what I saw was the connection with quantum mechanics. Oh, dear. Yeah. And um, when you, if you read through this again, I don't want to take up too much time. You, you might, uh, what you understand about quantum mechanics. Uh, and, and quantum mechanics, as you know, is, 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 is a very difficult um, thing, you know, to, to grasp and uh, for a lot of people. And uh, uh, but this is what I thought of. And the same with reading for um, the relation to quantum mechanics to both Baha'u'llah and the Bob. And... Uh, um, you know, uh, when when you said you know that the the um, the revelation of Baha'u'llah, uh, you know, uh, is 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 really uh, they present a new structure, and uh, you know, and I think that that of course is 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 very very true, and I wanted to say that the spirituality of language. That is a divine language, I believe, was uh, referred to by the Bob. He um, wanted to uh, transform language into precisely that, a spiritual language. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and... and uh, uh, he wanted uh, all. He wanted language, you know, and 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 all its main within itself, all the main concepts of what particular language, and to raise it to a spiritual level. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and this, I first I first got that, you know, when I was reading uh, A.K. Kumaraswamy, um, and he. Um, uh, and, and, and he refers, you know, um, he refers to language in that very same sense where, um, where all the main concepts, all the, all the real concepts of, of, of any language is spiritual in the first place. Well, if you're talking about a, a, um, a divine language like Sanskrit, for instance, or Arabic or Persian, that's true. But I'm not sure it's true of all the languages that have sprung up over the centuries. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. But your, your point about the Bob is an interesting one because he certainly uh, opened everybody's eyes, I think, to the level of uh, spiritual impact each letter of the words yeah. that were written had and he could actually do an exegesis of those letters 
so i mean it's it's you know it's all greek to me i <laughs> i don't have any experience with how those individual letters in arabic could be profound from a, a of divine manifestations point of view but clearly they can be that they've been invested with that kind of power yeah 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 well i think it is i think actually uh a lot of baha'is wouldn't agree with what i'm just going to say but what i think i found hidden so to speak in language particularly in sanskrit and i found it in english and there are other, other languages too and that is the, the um uh the spiritual attributes the divine attributes mm -hmm. are actually hidden in language and i think this is what oh. bob was referring to you see if you take a numerology and i think um uh, uh you're talking about the abjabs the abjad yeah. yeah uh i think uh, this is partly I think uh, what is involved in it. But if you take the active and the passive, if you the active words are all verbs. So, um, you know, uh, and you, if you go from there, um, you can um, actually uh, figure, I don't know what word to use, figure, figure it out that there is a spiritual connection just like in etymology mm -hmm. a lot of words as you know that have a meaning beyond its obvious meaning and uh if, and if you get into the etymology of the word you get a very different meaning of the word and often it's a spiritual concept yeah that's depending on who wrote it uh, for most of us plebeians i don't know that we're capable of using language with that kind of hidden meaning so much uh, because we don't truly understand those hidden meanings once yeah, you do I, then you can use them in that loaded kind of way yeah but I, I, once again though i think though that that uh, that this is what in a sense, the Bob is, is, is referring to. And, and um, uh, language has a lot to do with, uh, with what we see and how we see. Yes, it does. In a culture. And the individual has a way of seeing, and that's related to culture. Culture has a way of seeing and perceiving mm -hmm. uh, that is different from, from other cultures and so on, even though we're all human beings. Right. So there's a lot of things here that um, I think do t does tie in with semiotics. And what you're really talking about, I mean, in terms of Wilbur, is uh, different components that are defining a person's cosmic address. You know, the culture that they're in, yeah, the structure that they've evolved to, yeah, uh, what. Uh, are they are they strictly somebody that operates on the uh, the physical level, or do they have access to the subtle and the causal? All those yeah. things are factors that help you to understand where that person's coming to when they say that sentence that puzzles you. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's a big topic. Holy cow! Sure is. <laughs> <sighs> Well, thank you, David. That's good. Okay, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Meryl, you must have something that you want to ask. No, not tonight. Okay. Not yet. <laughs> it hasn't, it okay. hasn't perked up yet. <laughs> okay, well, I'm looking forward to what you have to say next week, though. <laughs> Put you on the hot spot. Right now, oh, no, it's not even become a thought. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Anybody else? Any takers? Danielle? Uh, this topic is... Um, 
I'm just uh, thinking. Uh huh. I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah. Well, I threw a lot of of high uh, high thoughts at you today. I don't think this is something that many people have been exposed to. Now, how many so, people have read to page six hundred and fifty in uh, the religion of tomorrow? <laughs> So, so my question that's kind of forming, okay, you've got people in their lives. I think, okay, what am I trying to say? No, I can't find words for it. Okay, well, I'll give it some more time. Yeah. I'm going to turn to Bill first. Uh, oh, and now Belinda, are you putting your hand up too? Is no? Okay, you're just waving. Okay, all right, Bill. Then yeah, I, I just wanted to to say that that we finally got to the point of like, how is this stuff useful? And that uh, um, you know, the the last part of the presentation here really kind of exploded that into uh, reality with what that was the very excellent. Yeah, it's too bad Harold wasn't able to be here tonight. I think he would have appreciated where we went. I hope he watches this online. And Jack too. So how do you, how do you see it though? Okay, well, now I think I've got. Oh, well, sorry, Meryl. I want to go back to Bill here to see if yeah. I can get him to talk a little bit more about how you felt it was exploded into reality here. Well, like like Meryl, I'm not doing a good job of forming thoughts tonight. Uh, tonight, but uh, um, generally, I think that uh, when you you know like setting forth specific examples of of uh, governments and institutions uh, uh, adopting the uh, uh, the underlying framework of uh, of uh, integral uh, uh, thinking and ideas and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, that that is uh, um, it, it. It gives you the idea that it, that you, as an individual, uh, when you uh, adopt this in in your own life and how you live your life, just that alone can have a huge impact. And I think you said something about this is what we are doing as Baha'is, because as Baha'is, we are either knowingly or unknowingly adopting. Uh, this kind of thinking, and uh, yeah. that when we have that worldview, and this is so in the realm of broken record again, uh, when we have that realm worldview of um, um, bringing, bringing our uh, um, uh, you know, at the worldview that we have as Baha'is, or as we, just, we don't have to say by Baha'is, we could say as integral thinkers. Uh, we have uh, something of great value uh, you know, to offer the world and that we're teaching. And I know there's a fundamentalist movement that says, if you don't mention Baha'u'llah in every teaching paragraph, you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think that if when we're teaching, we're bringing that worldview that we have as Baha'is, then we are helping to bring uh, whether you want to say the, the Baha'i perspective or uh, nuanced uh, integral perspective, uh, the, you're doing, this is to me what teaching is. And so when I say explode, I mean, it's an example of teaching, you know, uh, an idea that is so powerful that if adopted by a small group of people or an institution and put into action, it explodes in terms of its 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 uh, impact on our realities, and uh, it explodes uh, in terms of of, of bringing uh, humanity to, toward what we hope is its ultimate destiny of, of unity and justice, etc. Well, in light of those comments, I think you're really going to enjoy what we have next week. The way that Wilbur describes the integral uh, structure emerging uh, is very easy to see it in Baha'i terms.
So yeah. there's an alignment there that is quite stunning. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I have to go back and, and look at the recording of this particular presentation to really, you know, be able to absorb, you know, the 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 meaning, uh, the signs mm -hmm. of what mm -hmm. these signs are about. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay, Meryl, you've had time now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's all it figured out, right? No, it started to slide away again, but it has something to do with real life, real people connecting with these realities in a way that real people can connect with these realities and not too much word games or um, like, Oh, oh I know it slid away again. I can't seem to express it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Fair enough. Away. I know these are <laughs> when, when these are new thoughts, right? The, the, it takes it's, a while to grab happens, hold of them. Yeah, it's like when I read novels that are thoughtful, that helps me get into realities that I might not have contemplated before. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I hear a lot of words, uh, terms, I think, what? What's that? <laughs> well, I, I think Wilbur would say it depends on on your experiences. If If you have experience with the words that are being presented to you, it's easy. Yeah, but, well, yeah. for instance, I'm right now I'm trying to read Heidegger. Okay. Uh, that's a that's a very tall task because there's so many new words that he creates in German that the poor old translators are having a hell of a time bringing over into English. But don't But I don't have much experience with that. You know, so it's very difficult to hold it together in my mind. But don't we need, we need something more than just our minds. We need um, the lived experience being described as a lived experience. Mm -hmm. And then possibly giving it a name. I don't know. I guess you probably need to give it a name eventually. But just hearing words doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. It can point you in the direction, though, that those that some people have had that type of experience. And if you are attracted to it, you, too, could have that experience if you do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, but hang on. That sounds so mechanistic. Like, like. Things don't become real to me until I hear someone describing it as an experience, not just as a term. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Is that making any sense now? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's one of the reasons I focused early on in this last part of the course on Wilbur's life okay. and where he was describing particularly in one taste where he was describing his actual experiences yeah because I was hoping that that would be easier for people to assimilate than just the intellectual concepts that he was going to talk about so it's possible that you found that easier to digest than mm -hmm. what we talked about tonight right yeah, like you were talking about a lot of different terms. And I'm thinking, oh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> what are you talking about, Bart? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure a lot of people feel that way tonight. Okay. Uh, Bill's advice is probably worth heeding come back and watch the video once I post it tomorrow. See if it makes any more sense. 
that's one of the joys of this Zoom arrangement, right? That we can go back and look at all the mistakes that Mark made <laughs> as he presented this material. Anyway, I'm sensing that uh, people don't have a lot to talk about tonight, but I'm hoping that uh, it'll be a different story next week. Think about all those classes that I've given, all those things that I've had to prepare, and then think about what you have to prepare for next week. <laughs> Not too much, right? One week, that's all I ask. 24 seven for the next seven days. I want you thinking about this, coming up with ideas, <laughs> feedback. Anyway, no, I'll be very curious to hear what, what people have to say. Well, it this doesn't have to be long or anything. Just, uh, you know, whatever you feel. Meryl? Oh, I mean, what's sticking <laughs> with me is when Bill said, oh, how the Vermonters talk about flatlanders, and it just sort of suddenly came alive. <laughs> mm hmm <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing like a good example to uh, bring <laughs> things into focus. Well, I see we're at 9.02, so why don't we call it a night? So we shall see you all next week for our final time. Thank and at you, that Mark. point, the feast or the fast will be almost over. Oh, yes. <laughs> and thank you very much. It's very enjoyable. Thank, oh, thanks, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Thank bye, you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Your effort has been tremendous. The results, not so much, but. Oh. <laughs>